Today on this episode of Going Deeper, we are diving into probably what is some pretty familiar territory as we talk at length about the Sermon on the Mount and some of the questions that arise in that and some of the challenges that arise as we read Jesus's words to his people. I'm your host, Kyle McCaskill. I'm Doug DeGraffenreid. So join us as we go deeper. Well, all right, I've got my two Bibles opened here. I've got the ESV and I've got the NASB Strongs open here. Are you going to quote Greek words to us? Oh, I'm going to suggest what I think they are. Okay. And then you're probably going to correct me. No, I'm just going <laughs> to nod and go, that's okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, this week with the sermons of Jesus, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> This is the largest chunk of reading that we've tackled in one week, you know, content wise uh, yet in this reading program. However, I feel like a lot of what we're reading in this chunk is probably pretty familiar because if you've not heard a sermon on just about all of these and you've spent any time in the church, I mean, you're a pastor. How many times have you preached these? The Sermon on the Mount, I've actually done a sermon series on it that took a whole summer, mm-hmm. and um, I may do it again. I'd be um, okay with that. And the the thing with the Sermon on the Mount, particularly looking at it as a, um, a unit, a whole sermon, um, just reading through it a couple of times and just the richness of the what's there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we in the American church like to take something like the Sermon on the Mount and just slice it up in nice, fine uh, deli slices mm-hmm. so we can enjoy it on our sandwich. Right. But I really encourage folks to read it or listen to the entire mm-hmm. sermon at one time. Just sit yeah. there and be present with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and in getting ready for this, I rather than exegeting, I was looking at the Sermon on the Mount as, um, in terms of homiletics, the study of preaching and proclamation. And if you take it as a as a whole, as a whole, it sort of changes a little bit of how you interpret it. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to remember that the Sermon on the Mount is spoken to the disciples and by extension to the church. This is not an evangelistic document. This is not to get people into the church or people into faith in Christ. This is to describe what being a follower of Jesus is about. Right. So this is a description of how you should behave. And the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, those that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are you when you're persecuted from righteousness' sake or when you're reviled. If you think of that as an introduction to a sermon, what was Jesus doing? You've got this crowd of people who mm-hmm. are listening. He's describing what kingdom living is about, what it is about to belong to God's rule and reign. And you've got people in the audience who are poor in spirit. They mm-hmm. may not describe it that way. Or you've got people who've lost something, they're mourning, or those who are meek. And suddenly the crowd is listening and Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And one guy goes, well, that's me. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the merciful. Well, this guy over here is me. The other one, pure Mm -hmm. in heart. So what Jesus does with the Beatitudes is he's calling out people in the congregation and he's engaging them then in the message. Mm -hmm. They're suddenly interested because they have been described or um, uh, called out. Right, well, he's made it personal to them. It's it's now personal, it's not theoretical. And, And he goes and he sets his thesis sentence that, look, 
you guys out there that are uh, poor in spirit, mourning, meek, uh, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, all that, you guys are salt and light. Mm-hmm. Um, your life matters, and what you say and do and how you live uh, in the kingdom of God, that matters. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, light's everywhere. I'm... I, one of the things on my bucket list is to find the darkest place in North America and go sit on the hood of my car and look at the stars mm-hmm. because we have light pollution. Yeah. I mean, um, in the Kyle room, which no one can see right now, <laughs> uh, the theme for this room ought to be blinded by the light because yeah. it's everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and salt in that culture, the word salary come, the word salary and the word saline are the same root because Roman soldiers used to be paid in salt. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're in Louisiana for heaven's sakes, and there is not enough salt on anything. Right. Because the first <laughs> act, some put your plate down, grab the salt shaker, and go or for it. Or the Tonys. Um, yes, there you go. <laughs> Got to gotta have the Tonys, man. Mm-hmm. So G- Jesus is saying, you folks, I've got your attention now. The way you live your life matters. Mm -hmm. And he goes and describes the Old Testament way of living the life. Yeah. And we call this section the antithesis or the antitheses. You've heard it said of old, but I say to you. And he elevates the law to a level of motivation. Mm -hmm. So what you do matters. What you think matters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, how you behave matters, and he he you know clicks down some some um, important ones, and then right. he says, and when you're worshiping, um, your worship is between you and God. Keep it that way. Mm-hmm. Your conversations are between you and God. Here's how you have them. Mm-hmm. Um, your your generosity or or your stewardship of life between you and God. So make sure that your treasures are stored up in heaven, that you're not grabbing a bunch of stuff that's going to be rusted or thrown in a dumpster one day when you're not here. Yeah. Well, and I, I found it very interesting that in chapter 5, you know, there's some talk about, you know, doing good and, you know, being that salt and light. And so needing to show these outward signs of your, you know, at this point it wasn't Christian living, but it, you know, righteous living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and, more than thinking about it. it yeah. It's doing it. And then in the next chapter, it's almost like he says, but don't take credit for anything. Or, or, or keep it to yourself. Well, what had happened in his <laughs> culture, yeah, and I agree with you. What had happened in his culture is Judaism um, had become um, public in some practices, but they weren't practices that were edifying, that would lift people mm-hmm. up. They were practices that, put people down. Right. You know, the publican at the temple, God, I think I'm not like this sinner over yeah, here. Exactly. I'm, a, I'm a really good guy. I tithe and look at me, I'm praying and, and, uh, oh God, you're, you're bound to bless me. So he is saying that as you, you worship, as you serve God, serve God in a humble, mm-hmm. fruitful way. And he, he nails it or drives it home in the seventh chapter when he talks about judging others. Mm-hmm. Don't don't make value judgments about yeah. other people. Well, it's to me, what I noticed right off the bat in chapter seven was how quickly are we? It's it's Jesus knew our tendency to, oh, I'm here in this sermon. Mm, there's a guy that I know that needs to hear this. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and so mm. he's he's coming on the tail end of this and saying, but what I'm saying is for you to apply to you, not for you to apply to the people around you. And I think that's an important lesson that we need to be reminded of frequently because I know from my seat that I sit in while I'm listening to a sermon that there are tons of names that 
could come to my mind and say, oh man, it would be so good if so-and-so could hear this. And, yeah. and maybe not necessarily like, oh, this person is a scoundrel and really, you know, this will put them in their place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, oh man, somebody would be really encouraged by yeah. this. So it's not always, you know, it's not always the negative. It's not thing. always the elbow nudge, yeah. you know, that happens in the seats. But there are some wives. of those that go on. <laughs> there sure are. Yeah, I can see them from where I preach, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, that that's a that's a whole other theory of homiletics that one day we'll get into. Um, <laughs> you know, you the pulpit is a the sacred desk, as I like to think of it, is just that. It's a mm -hmm. sacred place, and. Um, Sometimes you have to be really careful with what you say and how you say it, uh, even when you're being prophetic. Mm -hmm. um, you want to take as many people along this journey with you as you can and, and standing there. I tell people, you know, they'll come out of church and say, boy, you were stepping on our toes today. And the, that's usually not a... Um, when I hear that, I go back and look at, what I've said and usually listen to what I've said because sometimes I didn't mean to step on their toes. Mm -hmm. But I tell people it's really true. If I've got one finger, finger pointed at you, i got three pointed back at me. Yeah. And I never do it. You guys, it's we together. Right, right. Well, and, and in the Sermon on the Mount, of course, Jesus had the authority to, to speak the way he was speaking. Mm -hmm. He stepped on a lot of toes. Um, and he called out some of the common practices of the day for sure. Well, he called out hypocrisy. Absolutely. Because, and, well, I mean, that's what you had with uh, the way a lot of the, the, the temple religion had evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. it, it created a them versus us. Mm -hmm. And even with their sacrificial system, there were... Um, if you had the money, you could buy a better sacrifice. Mm -hmm. If you were poor people like um, Joseph and Mary. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just going to say, remember Joseph and Mary yeah. had to, to buy the poor person's sacrifice yeah, for Jesus. They did. So, you know, we're, we all stand in an equal need of God. Mm -hmm. There is no... Um, there is no economy in heaven other than the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Jesus puts out, he invites people into the, the message. We call that the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. You're salt and you're light. You're important. Here's the Old Testament law, but I say there's a higher level of living in my kingdom. Mm -hmm. He gets to the seventh chapter and says, oh, by the way, even though there's a higher level of living and not everybody gets there, don't judge them. Mm -hmm. Do not judge them. Yeah. Um, it leaves us with the golden rule. And then as he ends the sermon, he gets to the important part. He says, okay, it's all a choice. Yeah. You got a choice in this. You can enter the narrow gate. The gate's wide, road's easy, it leads to destruction, and there are many who take it, but the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So um, whether or not the Sermon on the Mount becomes the Word of God for you is found in do you live it out? Yeah. Do you make this a part of your living? And um, Jesus is calling us to holy living. The Sermon on the Mount isn't easy. No, it's not. It's It sounds nice. There's a lot of platitudes that we pull from it, like you said earlier. Uh, we like to slice it up in nice, yeah, you know, Put it on your deli chunks. sandwich and it looks yeah. good. Yeah. And but when you really get into it, so one of the things that I've said before on... Oh, let's see. It may have been in, uh, well, I know on previous episodes, and I can't remember if it was this season or not, but especially when you get into the, the middle of and kind of the end of chapter five, when he starts tackling things like the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth mm -hmm. and all that stuff that was laid out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, some of those... Uh, laws that were set forward Lex by God. Talionis. That's, I was just about to you say about that. You were about to say that? No, okay. not I'm, a chance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and something that I noticed when I started reading 
Leviticus juxtaposed with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, because, you know, I wanted to know, I am reading, uh, oh, what's the verse that not a jot or a tittle will we'll be, fall away from the yeah, law. Yeah. I, until I, all is accomplished. Yeah. I cannot find it right now, but a lot of people that I've heard and I read some comment commentators have said that, oh, well, this is where Jesus undoes the law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I tend to bristle at that a little bit because instead of saying... Jot and tittles, Matthew 5.18. Right, right. Uh, instead of saying, nope, the law's no good anymore, Jesus takes it and says, okay, I'm going to tell you how to approach the law and I'm going to do something for you that the law never could. Mm-hmm. Because instead of saying an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he says, do not resist an evil person, slaps your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Jesus is saying to me, it says, what, what was written in the Old Testament, I'm taking it and I'm reframing it into the original intent of what was written in the Old Testament. Because the idea was... I, I'm not going to hurt somebody because it's going to cost me. Yeah. And now he's saying, don't hurt somebody because it's, it hurts them. Well, Old Testament law, when you, you've got the big 10, the 10 commandments, and then Judaism came and there were 613 laws written on top of the 10 commandments as commentary mm-hmm. on the 10 commandments. They're all external in nature. Yeah. They're all behavior. And what Jesus is doing is saying, your behavior is important. However, let's look at the the thoughts and the emotions that motivate and inform the behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's pretty easy for us not to commit murder. Yeah. But being angry with somebody? Mm-hmm. Oh, now wait a minute, Jesus. Uh-huh. You're getting personal there because we, we stoke our anger and we like to keep it in a nice box. And mm-hmm. sometimes we'll pull it down and we'll look at it and we'll imagine it and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll nurture it and carve it up a little bit, put our little box back and we can say, I've never broken any one of the commandments, but you're angry with somebody. Yeah. So Jesus uh, says the Old Testament law is important, mm-hmm. but I'm raising the bar for you guys yeah. and gals. He's, he's not lowering the bar. No, it's, I'm raising it. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually kicking it up a level. Mm-hmm. It's a great sermon. I encourage you to read it. Read it in its entirety. If you want to stop and mark something, go ahead and stop and mark mm-hmm. something, but make sure that you hear this um, holy. Another yeah. place that uh, we're told Jesus preached a sermon is Matthew 23. Mm-hmm. Um, Matthew 23 is actually a tough one to preach in the church today um, because uh, Jesus is basically telling the the... Well, he, he's 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 basically telling Orthodox Judaism, I would tell you to go to hell, but you're there already. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it's really uh, he he just pulls back the curtains and he lets them have it. And uh, there are very few words of grace and mercy mm-hmm. um, because what the the scribes and the Pharisees, what official Judaism did, is it took. Um, the commandments of God and rather than using and allowing the commandments of God to help people live abundant, fruitful, godly lives created a system that oppressed them that um, basically in certain ways enslaved them Mm -hmm. and then the system got really perverted and it became economic Mm -hmm. that if um, Doug commits a sin, uh, I got to go to the temple, got to kind of tell them, well, my sin was this. And they say, okay, uh, two turtle doves and one oxen. Yeah. And it's, it's so nice that no, we never got back to that as Christians. Oh yes. We brought it right back, man. We just, (laughs) 
we we <laughs> sailed it right in there. <laughs> um, I, I wrote an article for a newspaper several years ago, and I said, "What?" And I was being a little tongue in cheek. I said, "What got Jesus crucified was he was calling for tort reform. Mm -hmm. That he was trying to bust up the legal system within Judaism that held people captive, and." Um, it was a funny article, and in fact, what got Jesus basically crucified was he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with scribes and Pharisees about mm -hmm. Sabbath law, yeah. which was where they really got you. And um, the article was such that the Trial Lawyers Association of Louisiana um, wrote one of the newspapers and said, do we need to advertise about this guy? Do we need to... Do we need to call him some kind of <laughs> wretched person for talking about tort reform? And I went, ooh, obviously I hit a nerve. Uh -huh. So there, there are <laughs> legal issues related to what went on in Judaism. There were problems with the legal system that Jesus addressed, and mm -hmm. his addressing of the legal system is what, in the end, got him crucified. Yeah. If you look at it from a human standpoint— uh, Matthew 24 is another sermon, and the cool thing about Matthew 24 is um, the way it's structured. Um, it's about the end of time, and the third and fourth verse are important and instructive for us in this sermon. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when this will be, when what will be. He's talking about mm -hmm. the destruction of the temple. Tell yeah. us when this will be, what will be a sign of your coming, and what will be a sign of the end of the age. So within the third verse of Matthew 24, the disciples address three questions to Jesus. Within the rest of Matthew 24, Jesus is answering the three questions. Mm -hmm. We just don't know in what order he's answering them. Okay. Okay. Jesus mm -hmm. ultimately says about the end of time, I don't know. Yeah. That is something that belongs to the sovereignty of God. Um, until that day comes, you just need to be about living a faithful, holy, and Christian life. So um, Matthew 24 becomes interesting for people who want to try to figure out uh, when Jesus is coming mm -hmm. back. Um, again, three questions were asked. Jesus answers them, but we're not really sure in what order he's answering them. Yeah. Well, and what, what I'm pondering right now is, and maybe I'll get a little bit in the weeds here and you'll have to correct me. I have my weed eater. Okay. Go ahead. So God, the mm -hmm. Godhead is... Outside of space time. Yes. Because God created space time. Mm -hmm. this, this linear existence that we experience right now. Okay. And so at this moment, as Jesus is talking to the people who are asking him these questions, as he is fully human at this point, he has limited himself almost to existing within that scope of time and space. Mm -hmm. And so the father, one of the other parts of the Trinity is still existing outside of this linear existence that we have. I know I'm getting a little bit heady here. <laughs> I like to. Are y'all with us out it, there? I know it's. I, I may be going down a pretty long rabbit hole here. No, um, I, I know but, the rabbit hole you're heading down. I've I've heard it. But but I hear maybe some of the arguments against Jesus is that how could he not know? You know, when they ask him, how can he say something like only the Father knows? In in an instance like this, and to me, it's not that far of a, a leap to get there because he's living, breathing, walking, talking in our world. Mm -hmm. Well, and, ultimately, he does know. Mm -hmm. um, he does know because he, at the same moment he's completely human and mm -hmm. condescending and coming to earth, is still the Lord God Almighty. Right. 
So, you know, you got one of the mysteries of the incarnation mm-hmm. running there is, is Jesus says, yeah, there's some things I don't know, but there's another way to understand that. Okay. Did you ever, growing up, pose a question to one of your parents and their response was, go ask the other parent? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Could it be that Jesus is doing a little bit of that? You know what? I've never thought about it like that. I, that's sure. I, as you have said at times uh, in the past, I'm going to allow that. Okay, you're going to allow that. So good. Um, I love it when you allow us to think about things in a certain way. <laughs> Like I can stop it. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like me giving three free sins. Uh-huh. People say, how do you do that? And I said, well, just think about the whole concept. I can't do that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> again, these are words that Jesus um, tells us, look, the end is coming. And almost everybody in Jerusalem knew that uh, there was going to be some kind of conflict with Rome that would end up destroying the temple. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to be really smart to see that one coming. Um, And they associated the destruction of the temple with the uh, end of time or the end of the Messianic age. So Jesus, in not answering them directly, may have set a higher level for this is is what these things really mean, Mm -hmm. that uh, at the end of all of this, you need to keep trusting me and looking up because your redemption is drawing near. So the Sermon on the Mount, read it. Keep it all together. Read Mm -hmm. it one time, one way. Matthew 23, look out. It's just Jesus scorching them. Man, he's he's preaching on Mm -hmm. hellfire and damnation right there. And 24 is his end of the world sermon, which... um, there's a, there's a lot of good good truth mm-hmm. in this for you, particularly in this crazy time when we're um, worried about another spring with the COVID. Yeah. I will say to uh, re- affirm what you said about listening to the Sermon on the Mount, if you're listening to this or you're watching this, chances are you have a smart device. Mm-hmm. And if you don't already have the YouVersion Bible app, I will recommend... Uh, to, to go to chapter five of Matthew. There are some different readers, but the ESV yeah. has a, a very well-spoken, not, uh, not overly boring narrator. Uh, <clears throat> so download the ESV from version Bible app and just tell it to play. Mm-hmm. And you can listen on your phone. You can listen if you have an iPad. I don't know if it will do it on a computer or not. But you can listen just as we were talking about here because these are words that Jesus was speaking and so it makes sense for us to hear them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, absolutely do that. Yes. Well, I know we normally have three voices on this podcast. Uh, today, it just felt right to have two because you know what, what better type of person to spend a lot of time dissecting the Sermon on the Mount and these sermons of Jesus than one who is an expert sermon giver. Yeah, but you're an expert sermon listener. Oh, I don't. So you have a different skill set. Uh-huh. You, you, you've endured years, endured years <laughs> of sermons. Um, we, under, we understand some of our sermons mm-hmm. have to be endured. Well, you know, that's okay. Um, that's all right. Uh, so... I hope you all have enjoyed listening to this conversation. I hope you are encouraged uh, by what we have spoken here and that you find, I don't know, some new meaning, some, I don't know, a fresh perspective on the Sermon on the Mount and how you can hear them and apply it to your life. Apply it to your life. Don't, Don't go around trying to apply it. Other people. To your neighbor's That's life. Right. You have to life. love your neighbor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jesus didn't say love your neighbor and make sure they follow my words. <laughs> he just said love your neighbor. That's right. Uh huh. <laughs> so, but yes, if you have questions or comments about this particular gigantic chunk of text that we read this week, definitely send us an email to askgoingdeeper at gmail.com because. You know, in our Q&A sessions, we always enjoy having the extra questions 
and subscribe, like, comment, review. If there's a way to positively interact with the podcast, we ask that you would do that because it definitely helps fulfill kind of the mission and the purpose of what we do here. And so at that, I'm going to ask Pastor Doug if he has any final words for today. He's just sitting there. Jesus was a great preacher. Jesus was a great preacher. Jesus was a great preacher. Mm -hmm. He he was one of those preachers I read his sermons and think, wow, I wish I could say it like that. (laughs) It's probably okay to plagiarize some of Jesus' words. He was a great preacher, and Jesus was not long-winded. No. He was pithy. He was straight to the point, Uh y'all. So maybe, maybe preachers need to learn from Jesus. Maybe so. Mm -hmm. I think we all need to learn from Jesus. (laughs) Well, at that, I'm going to say thanks for listening, and we will see y'all next time. Mm